Tonight, in the wake of the New Zealand massacre, where 50 people were killed in a terror attack as they prayed inside their mosques, there are renewed concerns about the rise of white supremacy back here in the U.S. Is there a link between that and the rise of Donald Trump? A hate crimes expert joins us to weigh in. Then former Congressman Chris Shays joins us. The Connecticut Republican is a moderate. We'll ask him whether he even recognizes his party in the age of Trump, plus a whole lot of other questions. Also, the Mueller report isn't the only thing that will come out of the Russia probe. A former federal prosecutor joins us to walk us through how it could all play out. Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Andrew Whitman in tonight for Richard French. As New Zealand continues to mourn after 50 people were murdered inside their mosques last week, the country is taking swift action to try and deal with gun violence. We'll talk about that a bit later with former Congressman Chris Shays. The Connecticut Republican was one of the co-sponsors of the assault weapons ban in the past Congress in 1994. But we do need to note that the New Zealand gunman mentioned President Trump in a manifesto he posted online, saying Trump has helped to renew white identity and common purpose. President Trump was asked about that on Friday. Here's what he had to say. Today, white nationalism is a rising threat around the world. I don't really. I think it's a uh, small group of people that have very, very serious problems. I guess if you look at what happened in New Zealand, perhaps that's a case. President Trump also tweeted on this topic today, quote, the fake news media is working overtime to blame me for the horrible attack in New Zealand. They will have to work very hard to prove that one so ridiculous. This is also a major topic on the Sunday morning talk shows. Here's acting chief of staff Mick Mulvaney weighing in. I don't think it's fair to cast this person as a supporter of Donald Trump any more than it is to look at his sort of his echo terrorist passages in that in that manifesto and align him with Nancy Pelosi or uh, uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez. To say that there's some type of connection between between being against illegal immigration, which is what the veto was about for legal immigration, and the <laughs> the ruthless live streaming of murder of 15 people, the, the two things have nothing to do with each other. But by just about every metric, white supremacy and white nationalism are growing problems here in the U.S. According to new numbers from the Anti-Defamation League, white supremacy propaganda efforts like flyers and mailers nearly tripled last year. There was also a huge spike in racist rallies and demonstrations, as well as extremist killings. Also, the Southern Poverty Law Center, a group that tracks hate groups, says those groups are in fact growing in number. Joining me now, former NYPD officer Brian Levin. He's the director of the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at Cal State University San Bernardino. Brian, since the New Zealand attack, so much of this conversation about Donald Trump and white nationalism seems to revolve around Trump's own beliefs. Is he a white nationalist? Is he a racist? Is he an Islamophobe? First question for you is, does that matter in the wider context? You know, it, it probably does matter, but it escapes my ability to answer it. But what I can tell you is what uh, has been an effect of his uh, political activities. Give you an example. November 2016, election month, that was the worst month for hate crime going back till September 2002, the first anniversary of 9-11. The day after election day was the worst day for hate crime going back to June 2003. So, so we've certainly seen spikes uh, around certain things. We also saw a spike in anti-Muslim and anti-Arab hate crime above and beyond the increase we saw from the San Bernardino terrorist attack, which occurred five days before he made his Muslim ban proposal, which then appeared to result in an increase uh, above and beyond that spike. And if we flip it and look at President George Bush, he spoke at the Islamic Center of D.C. about tolerance. Six days after 9-11, hate crimes dropped by two-thirds the next day and two-thirds in the next year. So when leaders speak, it can make an immediate difference. We've also seen a 17 percent spike in hate crimes in 2017, the first year of his presidency. And our research, which we haven't even released yet, it's coming out this month, has shown that in 30 of America's largest cities, hate crimes are up again to a decade high in 2018. So, Brian, you have the data, but I don't know if it's possible to take us inside the mind of a white nationalist who sees or hears Trump or someone like Trump. And do we know how that might impact their actions and their courage to act on them? That is a great question. And, 
And you know, this is a bit more qualitative, but I'll tell you something. In the run-up to the election, we had not seen the unanimity of support for a successful mainstream candidate, certainly in my professional lifetime. Maybe you have to go back to George Wallace in 68 when he had uh, five states and, and got 44 electoral votes. But the bottom line is folks like the, the Grand Dragon of the Loyal White Knights for California, folks with a variety of alt-right groups, the Daily Stormer, David Duke, and a variety of others, were unanimous in their support, which has now waned because they regard him as a bit of a, uh, a snake oil salesman and a traitor because he hasn't yet come through on such things as his wall. I want to quote uh, what David Leonhardt wrote in The Times today. He said, the man with the world's largest bully pulpit keeps encouraging violence and white nationalism. Lo and behold, white nationalist violence is on the rise. You have to work pretty hard to persuade yourself that it's just a big coincidence. You agree with that? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if you look at the level of support within the extremist community, what they found was this. They had a charismatic mainstream political leader who could get their messaging somewhere where it hadn't really been uh, before, Cert not, certainly not with the ubiquity, uh, on, onto mainstream cable television, into political discussions. And for a while, we saw these white nationalists responding in a way that they hadn't before. And that was with really big, continuing, large demonstrations. Just listen to this. In the two and a half years leading just into and after Charlottesville, we saw more mega, not MAGA, but mega, that is large rallies of 100 or more white supremacists in those two and a half years than easily in the previous 10 to 15 years prior. Since then, however, with, with the implosion of the alt-right groups post-Charlottesville, we've seen a new strategy, which is involved with the internet, and also, on the other side, more stealth, uh, leaner, meaner, more violent types of groups, as well as, in the middle, groups that are papering college campuses throughout the country. And the ADL just came out with a report recently saying that that kind of engagement has tripled in the last year. What about the people who are on the fringes of white nationalism? If they hear the words of, of uh, Donald Trump or they see uh, some of what his, his thoughts are echoed out among them, uh, does that encourage, what, what's the impact that it would have on those people who are on the edges of white nationalism? Great question. Well, one of the things that we've seen has been a rise in engagement by these kind of hardened bigots, and we can measure that by the use of certain epithets and words. Uh, Andrew Thompson did a great article in Rolling Stone about 4chan. I advise people to look it up, and he gave us some, some great research as well. Bottom line is, when the president says certain things, it gets a response in that hate world. Uh, they, they take some of his apologies as a wink and a nod, but he's retweeted convicted hate offenders from Britain and also retweeted false statistics about black crime. Uh, coming from someone with a Twitter handle, White Genocide TM. And finally, Brian, uh, I want to ask you what I, about something I call the Mulvaney defense of Donald Trump, or at least that was the example this weekend. Asked about it on uh, Fox News uh, Sunday, or on CBS, rather. He said, well, take the words and put them in one category, take the actions and put them in another. On Fox, Mulvaney said, the president's not a white supremacist. I'm not sure how many times we have to say that. I know that always infuriates me. He's a 72-year-old man with decades in the public eye, did his own PR, yet time and time again, we're told, discount the actual words that come out of his mouth. I, I want to know what your reaction is, and is there a danger of sort of whitewashing the president's words in this regard? Look, uh, President Trump said Islam hates us. He, he, he had this, this uh, just over-the-top speech on uh, December 7th, 2015, and we saw hate crimes rise right after that. We also saw an increase, an almost across-the-board increase, according to FBI data in 2017. Bottom line is, it seems that his apologies are forced and, 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 and rather sparse. And what I can tell you is the extremist world that I study uh, now regards him, as I said, a bit of a traitor. But they galvanize behind him as what they call the best hope for white America. Brian Levin is the director of the Center for Study of Hate and Extremism at California State University, San Bernardino. Brian, appreciate the few minutes. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me.
And up next on RFL, former Congressman Chris Shays joins us to look at how gun control is stalled in Washington. Plus, we'll talk about President Trump and his latest tweet storm and a whole lot more.